Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event, COVID-19, What Principles Should Guide Our Lockdown Strategies Now and in the Future. I'm Terry Rhodes, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's event is sponsored by the University of North Carolina Program for Public Discourse and the UNC Center for Bioethics. The mission of the program for public discourse is to build our students' capacities for debate and deliberation, enabling them to be better citizens, civic leaders, and stewards of our democracy. The mission of the UNC Center for Bioethics is to provide a core facility for teaching and research, addressing the increasingly complex ethical challenges at the intersection of biomedicine and society. So this event tonight combines these two important missions to explore what principles should guide our lockdown strategies for handling COVID-19 now and in the future. We've assembled an excellent panel, all leading experts in their fields, who are sure to provide a lively and thought-provoking discussion. Our moderator is Dr. Myron Cohen. Dr. Cohen is the Jurgen Bate Eminent Professor of Medicine, Microbiology, and Immunology and Epidemiology, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Health, and the Director of the UNC Institute for Global Health and Infectious Diseases. Our panelists bring their expertise from the areas of health, economics, and ethics in human rights. Dr. Audrey Pettifor is a professor of epidemiology at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. She is currently leading a study to examine COVID-19 among faculty, staff, and students involved in and supporting research here at Carolina. Dr. Kevin M. Murphy is the George J. Stiegler Distinguished Service Professor of Economics and a MacArthur Fellow at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, as well as a faculty research associate for the National Bureau of Economic Research. Dr. George Annis is the Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University's School of Medicine and School of Law, as well as the director of the Center for Health Law, Ethics and Human Rights of Boston University School of Public Health. To get the conversation started, we have asked each of the panelists to respond to a question from our faculty director for the Program for Public Discourse, Dr. Sarah Truel. We'll start today's conversation by showing you these short videos before turning it over to our moderator, Dr. Cohen, to get the conversation underway. I trust you will find this evening's discussion insightful and engaging. Thank you for joining us. I think with this virus, we've seen how dynamic it is and how quickly the game changes. Um, we did not really flatten the curve. We might argue some states did, like New York, before they reopened, but for the most part, as we all know, a lot of states are now being criticized for opening up too early. Um, and I think we need to think about what, what was involved in that reopening. So did we have to reopen spaces where a lot of people gathered and perhaps weren't using masks like bars is that the best strategy for reopening the economy do we need to do that you know how do people get infected well there's an interaction between the, un the uninfected and the infected individuals that results in new infections and you can try to tackle those interactions from either side by uh, hiding the uninfected people so they can't get infected or by trying to isolate the infected people so they can't infect others and in some sense, social distancing kind of focuses most on the uninfected and the uh, test and trace tries to focus more on the infected. In a world with 194 countries, each country is going to do something a little bit different. And one of them is going to do it the best. And the question, and one question is, can the United States learn from that country? Can we adapt ourselves to South Korea or Iceland? So we're now seeing resurgences, and that's going to have an impact on the economy. And the longer we drag out people not following public health guidelines, the longer we're not going to be able to return to normal. We need to keep confidence in the public health system. And by not giving a clear message, I think people get frustrated and makes it more difficult to do any of the plans. 
So the, the trick for public health is to propose actions that work and that the public will support. We can reopen if it's done smartly and if people follow the guidelines. Otherwise, we're going to continue to be in this situation for a really long time until there's a vaccine. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Cohen. I'm going to serve as the moderator tonight for this panel discussion. Um, we will be discussing the prevention of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the cause of COVID-19. Um, I want to once again welcome our panelists to this discussion. Let me just say a few words before we begin, begin about uh, SARS. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the third coronavirus to attack the species uh, in the last uh, two decades, and it's arguably the worst. <clears throat> and um, there are three ways we can deal with any infectious disease. We can prevent it, we can treat it to prevent morbidity and mortality, or we can cure it. For SARS-CoV-2 prevention, we have three options. We can inspire behavior change, we can treat somebody with infection to reduce the concentration of virus so they're no longer contagious. We think of this as treatment as prevention. Or we can engage the immune system through vaccination, or we can provide antibodies passively that would also be able to prevent infection. These three um, ways of approaching the problem are not mutually exclusive. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to focus on uh, public health aspects and behavior change as it relates to COVID-19 prevention through a, a panel discussion. Um, the, we will talk for about an hour, perhaps less, and then answer any questions that you can, that the audience, you can provide in a chat box. Uh, nothing's off the table. You can be as creative, as innovative as you, as you like. Um, and as I've already said, let me once again welcome the panel and then let's begin with questioning. Uh, the first question I'm going to direct to Dr. Audrey Pettifor, who's already been introduced. Dr. Pettifor is a professor of epidemiology. She's worked primarily on HIV and she is focusing now on helping us to reopen the campus through a series of research investigations. So Audrey, one of the big themes are the strategies that are available to us. Dr. Murphy, who's on our panel, has written about the costs of lockdowns, which we also put shelter in place, Compared to other approaches we're going to discuss today. Our own president, Bill Roper, noted in the Science Magazine interview that we would know when to end lockdowns. Hospitals would be long overwhelmed. That was part of the initial strategy often referred to as flattening the curve. However, now cases and deaths are increasing in many states around the United States. And it's been argued widely that this reflects mistakes of opening too soon. So let me ask you, what do you think are the metrics that might justify sheltering in place, going back to lockdown in North Carolina or anywhere in the United States? Conversely, how do we know when to relax this kind of strategy? How do we develop a policy? Great, thank you, Mike. I think um, there's a number of metrics, right, that we've been following and I think that have been guiding states, some states, in figuring out when to relax lockdown strategies and those weren't always followed well. We clearly are following the number of cases of, of SARS-CoV-2 that we're seeing. And of course, this is driven by our testing, so which there's been a challenge with. So the more people we test, that's, that's better. And we wanna be looking at the percent positive. So of those that we're testing, how many people are testing positive? And if we see those numbers coming down and we're testing more people, right? So if we're increasing the number of tests and we're seeing you know, numbers decreasing, percent positive or stable, then maybe that's a good, a good sense that the epidemic is we're sort of keeping it in, in check and control. We also obviously wanna look at hospital beds, hospitalizations. Um, that was the big argument for flattening the curve that we didn't overwhelm the healthcare system and that we could you know handle the cases that came about so those i think are continue to be important metrics um and unfortunately i think in a lot of places people opened you know a lot of states opened before we really were seeing the numbers come down what that number exactly is it's hard to know because we've seen in countries that have reopened now you know 
flare ups again, like Japan and Hong Kong. Um, so it's dynamic, and I think we have to keep monitoring and adjusting. It's it's we're not going to be um, probably somewhere where we're just it's it's over and it's gone ever. Right. Thank you, uh, Professor Annis. Um, you have a different lens on this. You're a health public health expert, but also a historian and a, and a, um, related involved in civil liberties discussions and ethics. What do you think about all this and as it relates to lockdowns? First, I don't like the word lockdown. I prefer something a little uh, more descriptive, which is uh, stay at home orders, because uh, I don't actually think you're locked down, you're not in prison. But on the, on the other hand, very important for me and for, for most people in public health to take human rights seriously. Uh, there's a whole new field called health and human rights since World War II that's, that's grown up uh, in public health, World Health Organization, and our own CDC. Uh, to say that, if you're going to confine people, even at home, which is much better than confining them uh, in a prison, uh, that you have to make sure that they have what they need to live, uh, that they have communication with their family and the rest of the outside world, uh, and that they live, can live a decent life in that for the period of time, which is going to be short. There's no way Americans are going to tolerate being kept at home for, for more than a few months. Um, but. Nonetheless, you don't want they come out. You don't want them resentful of their government and everybody else either. Thank you, Professor Murphy. You are the economist on this panel, um, and, and which is a pleasure to have you. Let's explore the same question with an economic lens. In a recent article you wrote, you framed our options for mitigating COVID-19 as two strategies: large-scale social distancing, which I'll assume includes masks and hand hygiene and the other things we can do or alternatively screening, testing, contact tracing, and quarantine. You frame these as kind of dichotomous approaches to the same problem. You wrote that large scale social distancing policies are those that are applied to the general population and cover a wide range of non-essential activities. Examples of these policies include the stay at home orders we've just discussed um, in place in many countries. In contrast, screen, test, trace, and quarantine, you, you said, is much more targeted, seek, seeking to limit the spread of disease by focusing only on the potentially infected rather than those not infected. And it kind of reflects back to what Audrey was saying a few minutes ago about getting the number down so low that the chance you're gonna run into somebody who's COVID infected is reduced below some certain threshold. But the question I'm gonna ask you is, which of these two policies should we be pursuing right now, given where we are now? Because you wrote your article several weeks ago. Uh, what, what do you, kind of reflecting your article and where, where are we now? I, I think the thing we talked about in our article was that which of these policies made sense depending on where you are. And when you say we, I think it's really tough to talk about the United States as a single entity in that regard because different states are in very different places today, just as very different states were in very different places uh, in the spring. It's kind of switched, you know, up the northern states were much more affected early. The southern states are much more affected now, but I, I don't think we want to think about it that way. I think we want to think about, you know, what's the right policy for the situation different places are in today, and they're in very different places. Um, so that's one thing I would definitely keep in mind. I also think it's not just a matter of civil liberties. It's a matter of people cooperating, and I think George kind of hit it on the head. People are only going to do these things for so long, and, and you mentioned masks and you sort of threw it in the social distancing bucket. I would put it as very different because the thing about the stay at home order or whatever you want to call it is it's tougher to do the longer you do it because you get tired of it. It's easy to postpone doing things you'd like to do for a week or two weeks or even a month, but you know, you can't go that long and people are going to grow tired of it. Masks are very different. Masks are a behavioral adaptation that if you get used to them, become easier to do. There are things that you can do once you get used to it. And the feedback is very positive. If more people start wearing masks, it becomes easier for other people to do it too. So I would not throw masks in the stay at home order bucket because the economics and the human reaction to those things are so different. So uh, uh, Thanks, uh, that, that's um, provocative. Let me ask you a follow-up question. The the social the um, contact tra the testing, contact tracing, and so on and so forth. Um, that's proven unbelievably difficult in this country. 
as because we've had plenty of time to try and get ready to do these things, we don't seem able to do it. So under these conditions, what's most efficient to do now? Do you still have faith in the in the contact tracing approach, or has, has your faith been wiped out? I, and I'll ask that of, of George too. I, I think I, I think you have to. People have to be incentivized to do it. You have to have a system where people want to engage in that, whether it's employers who, as a condition for various benefits, like they, you know, there's a big discussion today of some form of uh, immunity. You might say you, if you're going to get that, you have to do certain things to, as an employer, you have to look out for and engage in certain activities. If you incentivize people to do it, they're much more likely to cooperate. The United States is not a place where a top-down order you must do this or must not do this tends to work very well. And you have to put it into people's interest. And I, I, I think if, if we make it so that it's in the interest of people to cooperate and engage in that kind of tracing, they'll do it. If you don't, they won't. And it's that simple. So let me ask, let me ask George a question just in follow up before we go on. Um, China, of course, a totalitarian state, it was not an option, but that you were going to have uh, contact tracing and testing, and that seemed to work for them, at least to this point, pretty great. Italy, on the other hand, is not a totalitarian, totalitarian state. I don't know that they incentivized um, this kind of behavior, but it, it seemed to have done better than... So, George, how do you relate to the same question? of Why have other countries done better than we've done in this uh, contact tracing uh, and uh, testing arena. I think you make the point that other countries are different than us, number one, and they are. China could actually put a ring around 10 million people and require them all to be tested, and they did, and then quarantined uh, every, everybody who was positive. It turned out many fewer people were positive than they thought. Italy was much more, uh, uh, I have to say, all over the place, although in the end they did quite well. Uh, in the United States, uh, I think this point's been made already. Uh, the states are different. Uh, and uh, what New York will do, that doesn't mean that's what Texas will do, or that doesn't mean that's what uh, Florida will do. Uh, and so far, we, contact tracing has been a disaster in the United States. But for, it's been for two major reasons, I think. First, you're not getting the results, but you can't get a test. And when you get the test, you don't get the results. And by the time you get the results, it's too late to do contact tracing. You've already uh, infected all the people that, that you're likely to. Uh, to infect. And number two, uh, we've decided in many places to do contact tracing uh, by a cell phone. And people don't answer the cell phone from numbers they don't know. And when uh, they find out the government's calling, they hang up. So we need a different way to do that if we're going to do contact tracing. Let me follow up with Audrey on uh, this is the same thing. So Kevin, Kevin believes we, and you've done a lot with incentives, Audrey like you of all people, have used incentives for lots of behavior change. Kevin believes it's possible that we could incentivize. First, we'd have to have a technical solution. We'd have to have testing that was efficient and, and readily available. But then what would you think, Audrey, would be an incentive? Do you think money is an incentive? Altruism is an incentive? I'm just curious your opinion. You use money and other school uniforms and other things. Is that a lot? Yeah, I mean, I don't see money being a, a, a feasible option here on a large scale. I, I think that the altruism and letting people understand what contact, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what contact tracing is, a lot of fear, concern about what the consequences might be. And I think there have been some nice articles talking about the not just the, you know, contact tracings to identify others so that they can get tested, but if people are actually going to then stay home, the social support that people need to make that work appropriately, if someone really has to stay home, how are they gonna get food? Who's gonna look after their kids? If um, you know the kid is, their kids aren't positive, that kind of thing. So I think it's a full system. And I think incent incentives can be thought of here as why should I do this? What's the benefit for me, for my family, for my community? I think that's probably what we need to be thinking about, not um, you get, I, you know, again, with that, you get $100 if you agree to do this. I don't see that, you know, working. Well, you on the point, incentives are not just about payments to people to do something. It's about making it less costly, less burdensome for them to cooperate. And that is part of the incentives, eliminating the negatives as much as adding to the positive. I guess, I guess the flip side, just as an observation, would be the stigma and fear of identifying yourself as having COVID 
may also be a substantial reason not to want to know you have COVID, not to mention all the downsides of economic and, and societal. So let me let me ask one, all three of you one other question before we kind of leave this general theme. So the alternative, so we, we, we took Kevin's, um, no, Kevin identified at least a couple of different strategies, but then there is an alternative of just let people get infected. The, the Swedish said, you know, they threw up their hands and said, we're gonna try to protect the most vulnerable people so they don't die, but we're going to try and get, let enough people in, get infected so that the probability you're gonna run into somebody infected is gonna be reduced. It gets back, gets back to one of the points Kevin made in the uh, earlier uh, uh, movie. Um, so how do, uh, does anyone of the three of you want to go for herd immunity uh, on a pur purposeful herd immunity? We may be doing a natural experiment of herd immunity in states that are out of control, but does anybody believe we should be doing purposeful herd immunity? Let me start with Kevin. I think it, as a broad strategy, no. Thinking about who gets infected, I think you want to think of relative costs and benefits, again, of different people getting infected. So I, I do think that protecting the most vulnerable is a important priority and you focus your attention there. The other one is getting cooperation. And, you know, the way you don't get cooperation is you ask people to do things that are costly for them that have low benefits. And you may wish you could get them to cooperate on every margin, but focus on the ones where the biggest benefits and the lowest costs, you'll get the most cooperation for the longest. Hmm. And it, that ties into herd immunity a bit because it sort of says, focus your efforts where you think they're most effective. And George, what do you think? I don't think much of herd immunity. I mean, <laughs> here we are with this great uh, uh, medical establishment and what we come up with is, oh, we're going to just let nature take its course. <laughs> let everybody die. <laughs> no, that's politically you and that, that's just a loser. Uh, Audrey? No, I agree. I mean, I think it's it's not a first strategy. You know, if it starts to happen by natural causes or when we get a vaccine, that's that's different. But it can't be, you know, um, our our approach to, to the situation. Right. But we we don't obviously we don't know how many people would have to be immune. We don't have any idea about what immunity really looks like at this point. How durable natural infection is. We don't have a vaccine at this point. We don't know how long a vaccine will last. So this is very magical thinking getting us back to what can we do right now, which is the point of this discussion tonight. Let me move on. Um, George, let me let me ask you about um, the, the policies and the history. Um, and you kind of got at this a little, I just want you to extend um, your answer. Um, so we, we, and you indicated already, so states have used a lockdown strategy and some other strategies, and they, and you said people won't tolerate them, but it gets at civil liberties on autonomy, and there's a history to all this. Can you just go a little bit into, give us some examples of how history would tell us what would happen if we try lockdowns for any length of time? Yeah, I mean, there is there is a history to it, but uh, uh, not a deep one and not a long one. I mean, we, we did have, actually back in 1918, uh, we had people quarantined in the great Spanish flu, which is the closest thing uh, we have to this. And people objected and, it was also the time when the 14th Amendment was finally being applied uh, to the state. So people found, argued that they needed due process, that if they were going to be locked up, they had to be notified where they're going to be locked up. They had to have a chance to argue that they weren't infected or that they weren't uh, hadn't come into contact with anyone, that they weren't a danger to anybody else, uh, and that they should be uh, free. And basically, since then, since World War I, Almost all of our cases have been uh, related to uh, either smallpox or tuberculosis, which are not at all like like what we're dealing with now. And uh, a, a number of uh, quite bright uh, uh, public health scholars and lawyers have kind of argued that uh, we shouldn't even model what we think the law is going to look like uh, for COVID on tuberculosis and uh, smallpox. Just too different, and that instead. We should, using those cases, we should use the curfew cases uh, because they're the judges get to say uh, what makes sense to the population as a political statement. And most of the judges let uh, governors make those decisions themselves. The judges aren't going to make it. But that, that strikes me as reasonable. Uh, really, that's what we're looking at is a giant uh, public policy issue here that has really 
uh, almost uh, no precedence. Uh, and uh, probably that analogy to curfews uh, is a pretty good one. Well, let me let me follow up with that just because I've asked you this before and I, I kind of know the answer, but I'll ask the question again. Okay. Um, we're living in this world where governors make rules kind of de facto and then they get sued or mayors make rules and they get sued by the governor and it's a chaotic place whereas in HIV at least as I recall it years ago legislatures pass laws I'm not saying all the laws were good laws but at least they got together and said we need laws on the books but I don't understand why there's are any legislatures in the United States thinking about laws related to COVID and how do you feel about laws compared to governor, governor, governorship um, de, uh, demand or whatever you want to call it, so, George? Well, that's actually a great question. Uh, and it goes to the heart of public health right now, whether public health should be a federal national system, which I think it should be with the CDC and the president taking the lead, or whether it should be up to each individual governor to make policy which I think is ultimately a bad idea because illnesses, I mean, I'm to say this, everybody knows this, the virus does not stay within a state or within a group of states or within a country, right? Uh, we really do need national leadership in public health. Do, do we have federal public health laws? Do we have, is there an example of a federal public health law? Federal laws so far, but almost exclusively on funding. Uh, the Ryan White law, for example, HIV AIDS, you remember. Yeah. The federal government has to provide the funding. Also, the CDC has no regulatory authority, but it's a national agency that has had in the past a uh, very good uh, uh, trust from the public and, and from others. Uh, and that's good. And the FDA as well is a good public health agency, and it's a, it's a federal agency. So there are, there are some examples, mostly uh, unlike that, except for the FDA, they're not regulatory. A lot, they're more like NIH, which provides funding for research, and they provide a lot of funding for uh, for looking for a COVID vaccine as well. Um, but you have to have federal leadership here, even by default. Well, uh, let me ask Kevin a follow-up question to this whole discussion, going back to kind of what you were saying earlier. Economically, so another thing on the table is the cost of all of this to our economy, which is not, not news to anybody. What's what's the most efficient way to handle all this? What's the economically most sensible policy? Uh, you know, I think, again, you always have to start with costs and benefits. You always have to think about whether, and this is where the one size fits all, doesn't seem to work. And we've talked just, you know, George just talked about national leadership. And I, I don't think there's a problem with that or having a national policy. But what I think doesn't make sense is saying the same restrictions or the same modes of behavior are right for everybody in every situation that that's not what we mean by at least what i would mean by a national policy it means if things are in the same situation in different places for different people they should be treated in the same way it doesn't mean you do the same thing for everybody and i think that's the biggest problem i think where people kind of mix two things together like we oh we need to do this and we need to do it everywhere as opposed to saying no we need to behave in a consistent coherent fashion and we also have to recognize that the disease crosses borders i agree 100 percent with that that you know if i beat it back where i am but you don't i'm probably going to suffer consequences for that and we have to take that into account and individual states don't have the incentive to do that um but i think we've erred in lots of different directions and not just opening too early if that's what people want to say you know we've induced fatigue in other places it's like in some sense you might say in some of these places we probably closed too early we should have done everything later when, when it was more needed and that's a point we made in our paper that you only got so many bullets in the gun you don't always shoot them whenever you can you shoot them when they're most effective and i think we're bearing some of the consequences of that right now um do, do you think but do you think we should have a federal policy that's like a menu? Are, are you in favor? Because much, of, I, I do understand completely, one of your, your big argument is tailor prevention efforts and, and time them so you get the maximal benefit. No one could argue that. On the other hand, without a federal policy, it's become chaotic to say the least. 
So are you in favor or against a federal policy? And if we did have a federal policy, could you accept a menu? Like here's the things that are, I mean, I'm curious because you're, you're pretty much a state's right guy, guy right now. So I don't know about states' rights. I'm more like individual rights. Individual I, I, rights. You really so, have to let, you have to work in a way that people are going to want to cooperate with what you're doing. And they're going to base their decisions on the reality on the ground where they are. And if you try to impose a rule that might be the very great rule for somebody else, they're not going to be very cooperative with that. And, you know, I, and I think George hit the nail on the head when he first started. You got to think about it both in terms of workability as well as effect. It won't be effective. It's not workable and people don't cooperate. And we're seeing some of that right now. Mike, um, can I come in? Yeah, please. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I totally agree with this point about, you know, um, knowing what I'll call knowing your epidemic, right? From HIV, that's the first thing that we talk about is your response, your prevention response has to be based on the epidemic that you're seeing, who's being affected, where is it most se severe? And I think that that makes sense here. At the same time, I think, we're, you know, and you have to have the effective tools. And I think what we're being challenged with now is public health funding has been slashed. So I was just looking at a map um, of a nice project about, you know, resources for contact tracing. And I think there's like five states all in the Northeast that actually have sufficient testing, contact tracing kind of resources. So yes, we, we want to um, know our epidemic and be responsive, but I also think we're really stymied by not having the resources to effectively respond and not having the expertise in states and seeing public health agencies and um, officials sort of um, fired and sidelined by politicians who don't like, you know, some of the, what they're saying. So I think that's a challenge. I, we tried to make some of these points in the paper we wrote, which is, you know, again, you, you want to make the resources available to them and they, they will, you can choose to use them. And, you know, it, making it easier for states to do contact tracing or whatever the policy is you want them to follow, is a great way to do it because you're working with their incentives, not trying to impose your decisions on them. You're helping them make better decisions themselves. Uh, I guess one could build consensus. I'm gonna ask another question. And let me remind the audience that we're gonna run out of, uh, we're gonna run out of questions, but we, we very much welcome the questions of the audience. So please, I'm hoping that um, the, ch the uh, chat box team is getting questions. And I, I, I'm not sure that it's so please ask some questions. But getting back to Kevin, let me ask you a question. Um, and that is um, the, the economics. So, well, let me first get the consensus point. Consensus, I think, is that um, we need we needed or still need federal leadership at testing. So the testing is available um, beyond where it is today with speed that makes it credible. And I guess there's some consensus around resources for contact tracing writ large. That is. Um, having distributing funds and training in some way that would make this credible in a way that it's not credibly currently. I saw in the news that in, in Miami, only 17% of people with COVID were subjected to further contact tracing. So Kevin, let me, let me though, so I think there's consensus around what I just said, that the resources for better testing in a timely fashion and for resources for contact tracing could be federalized it should have been federalized in a way that would have been, you know, like the Ryan White Act. I mean, that was a very good example you gave earlier. Until the Ryan White Act, it was just totally chaotic for how do we give care for people with HIV infection. And that really was resolved by the example you gave. So, Kevin, you want to add something? Yeah, I would say, but it's important to distinguish funding and support from direction and telling people, you know, being in charge of oh, we're going to do the development, we're going to decide on what gets done. We, we've had problems with that already and when it came to testing in the early days. I mean, the idea that, oh, no, we don't want other people trying to do this, we will do it, I think that's a dangerous approach. Mm -hmm. I I think that's why I like the Ryan White Act approach is the saying, you get to choose, you know, it's a kind of the government's behind it, but it, they're not telling everybody what to do. Yeah. Well, there are metrics within there, but you, but there's the extreme. But that's what you want. You want, again, I think it's not like, and you're going to do it and you're going to love it. You know, that's not a great approach. Um, but you did bring up something that's extreme. 
we went from the problem with the CDC, which you just indicated with the early tests that we're trying to develop and centralize to privatizing this in a way that we've overwhelmed the private sector, which was never, even the, these giant laboratories that we use all the time and not keep up with this demand. So obviously we, we, we got to learn something from all this, but let me ask Kevin before I leave you, what, what's the most devastating economic impact within the context of our discussion? Is it the unemployment rate? Is it, I mean, what, what do you think? Is it the GDP? What, what's the thing that, that is the very biggest problem economically? I would say it's the long-term consequences that, you know, we tend to focus on GDPs down from where it was. And the longer we go on with a system like in the state we're in, the bigger the long-term consequences be. And they come on several dimensions. One is students are losing out on learning. And it's an enormous cost, particularly for young kids. Distance learning is a very poor substitute for in-person learning. Secondly, businesses are going under. That's bad for businesses, but it's even worse for their employees. People who've been on a job for a long period of time lose enormous amounts when their company goes under. They just do not get another job that is as good for them as the one they had. And the longer you go on with an economy that's underwater, the longer the effects are going to last. There's no quick bounce back the longer this goes on. So I, I think that's to what worries me. We can weather a short-term decline. It's the long-term consequences that worry me the most. And those come from education, long-term job loss. Because when people lose their jobs and people lose their education, they will have a worse life for a long period of time. And that's what worries me more than anything. Let me, let me move to another topic um, that, um, and this attracted a lot of attention in the national news. Now, Tony Fauci, who's well known to everyone, I think, in the United States, um, indicated that um, early on, he indicated that masks were not needed. And then his explanation for that was that he was concerned that, that the masks would be unavailable uh, for healthcare workers. Um, and um, I think in, in Tony's favor, at the time when he made that statement in February, it wasn't really appreciated how well masks really work. And, and Kevin's already dealt with the idea that masks maybe should be separated as something that's acceptable over very long periods of time in, in many different cultures. But I think that the problem we ran into is that now there's a belief that's a general belief that we've, we've earned the mistrust of the general. So at this, I'm turning this over to George. What are the what are, what are the implications of all this back and forth in terms of public trust? How do you see it? And again, from a historical lens, from, from every lens, are we going to be able to win back the public trust? Are we done? Um, what's, what's your opinion? Uh, very, very difficult to win back the public trust once you've lost it. I, mean, I spent most of my career uh, in, in working about informed consent in medicine, what doctors have to tell their patients about what the risks and benefits are, of procedures, for example. And I think it's all pretty well recognized in medicine that that's the doctor's obligation is to tell the patients the truth uh, and to share uncertainty when you don't know the truth. Public health really hasn't gotten there yet. Public health managed public health. It's a heredity, some might call it. But uh, public health are the good guys. They really believe they're doing good, and most of the time they are doing good. And some of them believe because they're doing good, uh, they can exaggerate to get the public to do good too. To get the public not to smoke, for example, or, or not to you know wear seatbelts and uh, do things that are good for you. Uh, and that has a big price. The public finds out you are exaggerating or what you said it, it may not be true, whether it's about masks or anything else. Uh, they're not going to do it. Certainly not just because you tell them to. They're, you're going to have to give them. An incentive is what I'm saying. You're going to have to figure out a different way uh, to uh, convince the public to quote, follow good public health advice. So I'm one of the people that believe that public health has an obligation to share uncertainty uh, instead of going on and saying, oh, masks don't help or masks do help. Here's what we know about masks. And you get to make your own decision. Or here's why your governor has decided everybody's going to wear a mask. Right, uh, but it's almost never going to be a hundred percent certain. So what, what are we doing? Okay, but what do we do? Okay, uh, let me ask all three of you those. Okay, fine. We went through this window. 
Um, and it's interesting to me because like, I got to admit some of the biblical early on about this because I myself was confused. Then more and more data then, and we work a lot in China, and the Chinese said, look, ass work, what are you doing? In fact, I got a kind of a box of ass in the mail yesterday from China out of the clear blue sky, which I don't really know what that meant. But, but um, my point is, now now we know mass work. They, they benefit the person wearing them, and they benefit the person who's infected, cannot spread infection. What do we do now? How do we get people back on the road to masks? Not to masks, it's masks. So, George, do you have an answer? What do we do other than say these things work? Well, I think you have to apologize to the public that you, you know, what you said before wasn't true. And here's why you said it, and you shouldn't have said it, but that shouldn't stand in the way of, now that we know what the answer is, uh, we should still do it. But I don't mm -hmm. think you should say, just do it because I'm telling you to do it, even though last, you know, three months ago I told you something exactly the opposite. Audrey, what do you think? The students were telling them, just do it. You know, you can't be in a classroom without a mask. I, I guess Kevin would, would I, I'll get his opinion in a second. So Audrey, what do you think? We have to have a mask culture. Yeah, and I think there's certain contexts, like in a classroom where it's easier to quote unquote mandate mask use. I think what's harder is in social circumstances, you know, and I think that's what we've talked about today. How do you change culture? How do you get people to see the benefit and not feel weird wearing a mask when they're standing, you know, in a, in a space with their friends or their colleagues and not feel uncomfortable? And that will take time. And I think that leadership helps. I mean, the fact that Trump did wear a mask, what, a week ago, two weeks ago, not that long ago. I mean, I think that those are, those are important steps. We've seen in many spaces when public leaders make clear statements about um, health facts, we think about HIV as a perfect example, right? People will attribute some of the declines in Uganda to the president where, versus South Africa, where President Mbeki like denied HIV. There's all kinds of um, consequences around people being willing to test or take treatment. So I think having clear messages, even if it's now and, and you know, acknowledging that perhaps we didn't know as much or we were trying to save masks, but I think clear messaging and change, getting people to change the social norms um, will help. I think it can't just be from up top. I think you need sort of community change as well, which will happen when kids and friends, see their friends, see their families. Hey, Kevin, let me, so there's a $645 fine for not wearing a mask in Hong Kong. This is yeah. the converse. So I'm going to let you argue against it and tell me how I, you know, Look, I think that I think two things. One, I think lying, you know, not being honest with people has real, real costs and they're not limited in public health. I think, you know, people's willingness to listen to so-called experts is diminished every time they find out what they were told wasn't either true or people knew it wasn't true. And they were adequately informed that, hey, this is our best understanding now that may change but given what we know and i you know that's when i try to talk to people i try to tell them exactly that look this is what i know this is what we think we're not sure don't just you know i'm gonna i'm gonna can i don't want to just tell you listen to me i'm an expert i'm gonna give you the reasons that i have and i think why i think the way i do and hopefully i'll be able to influence you if i tell you something though that's not right we're going to bear a consequence, not just in public health, but yeah. in other aspects of life. Well, and, let me, well, let me follow up on that and just kind of jump to something very far forward. Um, I, I don't disagree with anything you said. I think that generally for infectious disease people, we say we don't know the rules and we tell people we don't know the rules. and We're trying to learn the rules. And until you know the rules, you do the best you can do without the rules. Maybe we got too far in front of not knowing the rules. Now that we know the rules, we know masks make a difference. Um, we need to recreate reality, but we're about to enter the same space again. We're making, we're testing many vaccines commonly right now. Um, one, two vaccines started testing started yesterday. More than 150,000 people signed up, at least be uh, potentially available to take vaccines. But we, in order to get herd immunity through vaccines, we're going to have to vaccinate a huge number of people in the United States. I, I'd like to ask all of you about public trust and vaccination. Um, so let's let's go. So, George, are we going to have a terrible problem with vaccination because we're rushing it? As, I don't want to say rushing it. We're, we're trying to make a vaccine faster than the society has ever made a vaccine before. Is that going to lead? I mean, where we are now, can we foresee a problem or 
are people so excited about getting out of their house and getting a vaccine, they're just going to take the vaccine and, and hope for the best. Well, Kevin's saying yes. That's a good sign. Why do you say yes, Kevin? I, I mean, I think people are very, very open to a vaccine, whether that they'll be the they'll be the people who want to avoid it. But the answer doesn't depend on getting 100 percent of the population vaccinated. It depends on getting enough people vaccinated. In my personal judgment, and again, it's based on my judgment of the situation, is people see a vaccine as a good alternative to what they're enduring now. Mm-hmm. And that's the one upside of how bad people feel the situation is now. Right. It makes it much more open to a vaccine, in my mind. Yeah, we, we think of this as a biological solution. I mean, we kind of divide into biological and non-biological solutions. Americans like biological solutions. Oh, so, so, so it's so hard for us to do the things we've tried to do. The biological solution is like a rescue. So it's treatment, rescue drugs, we call them. And George, what do you think? Are we going to have trouble or is this all going to work out? Well, I think it's going to depend a lot on the vaccine itself. Uh, right now, the FDA has put the bar pretty low, 60% efficacy. Uh, although that's what the flu vaccine basically is every year. So some people will be fine with that. Some people, it depends, it'll depend what the side effects are too. Some people will shy away from if there are any side effects at all. Uh, I think it's an open question. The anti-vaxxers are out there. They don't like it, but I assume no one is suggesting that we forcibly vaccinate everybody in the United States. We don't have to do that. And that would just create a horrible response. So it's got to be voluntary. And we're going to have to, I think, convince at least a significant proportion of the population that this is worth doing. But you've, you've raised a whole other dimension of question, and that is for what vaccines are, quote, mandatory in the United States. Those are mostly school-aged children. To my they opinion. are. That's right. So, so are you now thinking that we would make COVID vaccine mandatory for school-aged children? I think you're, you're not favoring that, but you kind of threw it in to the possibilities. Well, I mean, you can see the school districts right now are really – shy about opening up now and they'd much prefer it if the, all their kids were vaccinated wow that's a so that's a great segue to a, a few and then please could we have a bunch of questions that we're going to start answering but please keep sending in your questions because you're curating them and making them you know um, um as a group um so uh, uh, now audrey i'm going to turn to you because you're the one to my knowledge of school age children when i look when i look at george and i it seems unlikely that they're school age. It's possible. Um, so you have school age children, and I know. What do you? I, you mind if I ask you a personal question? Go what for you, it. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like how you feel about this. You, you know, what is your personal feeling about opening schools? Should we open them? Should be, children get another semester off? What are the consequences? Um, and so on and so forth. W- would Would you agree with vaccinating school age children as a mandatory if we have a sixty or seventy percent efficacious vaccine? What are your feelings? And both as an epidemiologist and as a client? I think this is a really, really tough question. You know, I think school is obviously, as we talked about, really important, right? Not just for educational growth, but social, emotional. Um, and it provides important protective time for kids so that parents can work. I think this is a challenge, you know, that has an economic consequence. And obviously, it's not just the kids, which we keep hearing, it's the teachers and administrators and people who are in the schools. So, I think, um, you know, there's sense that kids get less sick with COVID. So do, should should it be mandatory? I think when we know more about how well it works and how safe it is, then we could think about it. But certainly for educators, they may be a population that we do want to vaccinate, um, you know, uh, and whether it's mandatory or not, but could be a high priority population. Um, I think, you know, we need to learn from countries that are reopening schools and see how it's going and what works and what hasn't worked in different contexts. I, I personally feel like um, for people who are able to work from home and to um, to educate their kids from home to help decongest schools right now, that that's probably a good strategy for the short term and keeping school spaces for kids who really need to be there either you know, parents who have to be in the, you know, frontline workers or kids who have special needs and need to be in the classroom. Um, that That's kind of my thoughts right now so that we can do physical distancing more more carefully until until such a time as we feel we know what's really going on with kids. Do you think the schools and communities that are having big outbreaks right now 
should open or stay closed? Well, there are, most of them are staying closed, right? I'd like California, if you are a, a watch district, you're remote. I mean, Chapel Hill just offered high flex, which was sort of a choice. And we just went to remote for the first nine weeks. So I think more and more um, school districts are going um, remote for the beginning of the fall where there are outbreaks. Now the National Academy of Medicine has a committee um, that is supposed to prioritize vaccines by December. It is assumed that there might be a vaccine by December. Who's supposed to get the first round of, of vaccines? Uh, the priorities that people talk about are um, healthcare workers, um, people living in nursing homes, if they can respond to the vaccine. But you've raised, well, all of you have raised, and I'll go to Kevin in a second, Audrey, you've raised teachers as a very high priority and maybe children as a high priority. Is that right? I mean, should 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 one write the National Academy of Medicine and say, think about this group? Uh, Audrey, is that your your I don't think teachers, I think we need to know more about kids. If kids don't really get very sick, uh, and also if, they're, if they are less likely to shed, we don't have a ton of data, but if they are not l less likely to make adults sick, if they're more sentinels and their parents are infecting them, that's stuff we need to understand because maybe if there is a scarcity of vaccine, then that's not a priority population right now. I think we need to learn more about children. And we better not tell the rule before we know the rule is what you're saying. We better, be correct. George, <laughs> what do you think about, George and Kevin, what, what do you think about this issue of school-aged children, vaccination uh, of teachers, and so on and so forth? The data, I mean, fortunately, from a data point of view, other places have been opening schools in, in various ways from which we should be able to learn. And in my understanding, based on what I've been reading and looking at, is that the preliminary evidence seems to suggest that kids are both less likely to get seriously ill but maybe even more or less likely to spread it. But that's outside my area. That's me reading. Yeah. Other, but we should learn more about that. Uh, but, you know, the, we certainly know there are groups that are very high risk for severe consequences. And we know there are groups who are very likely to be exposed. Those would be the natural places to start for priorities for vaccines. And, you know, again, you're going to get cooperation because people don't want to get the disease. And so the people who are going to get exposed to it have high incentives to cooperate. And I'll, pre I'll go out and predict it now. If we have a vaccine that has low side effects and is widely viewed to be reasonably effective, I bet there'll be high take up. I really do. I think it's there. People are dying for a solution. And Americans, like you said, are always looking for the cure. They're always looking for the silver bullet. And we better be careful not to tell them it's a silver bullet when it's not. But I think even if we're honest with them that it's modestly or moderately effective, I think we'll get cooperation. I'll go out and let them say that right now. Um, just by way of information, the vaccines that are being tested are actually not necessarily supposed to prevent infection. They're supposed to prevent progression of disease. That's the end point that's being pursued so that you wouldn't fear that you would end up in an ICU intubated if you had a vaccine. Likewise, developing treatments is to prevent progression of disease. So you're getting a treatment early, trying to change the world as fast as possible. Um, but, and, and the last thing is, I think that the data about children is, is not out there. And, and like vaccines and children, we better be correct and transparent. That's what I learned from George like five minutes ago. We better not be wrong. So I think that 10 to eight, 10 years old and greater, there's now substantial data that 10 year olds can be infected and infect somebody else. So I think once you're at 10 years of age, at least that's what data I've seen from Korea and a couple of other countries. So it's younger children that we don't have enough information about for a variety of reasons. Um, and so just that's just by way of what we know now. But I, I, again, I don't claim that we have all the data we need to make it. Somebody in one of the chat room people says, oh, I know for sure what's gonna happen with younger children. Um, so let me let me ask. We're, we're running out of our, our uh, allotted time, and I'm going to start going to the um, audience questions right now for a couple of minutes. But before I do that, do any of you like? Do you want to make any statements about this general conversation? I think we there's a lot of consensus about some pretty big issues. Um, Audrey, you first. Is there something you want to say in summary of where we are before we start answering questions? I guess I think, you know, as much as we want this to go away and things to go back to normal, I think the thing that um, 
keeps me up at night, but I think is a reality is I don't think we're going back to normal. I think there's going to be a new, you know, we're now in a like post COVID world. And so how do we, how do we operate in that world? And we all are really hopeful that there will be a vaccine um, next year on the horizon at some point with all the um, stipulations that we've talked about. But I think until then, how do we, how do we resume some semblance of normalcy because staying, um, you know, home, for the indefinite future is not sustainable for for multiple reasons. So, you know, how can we operate as a society safely with both the behavioral, the prevention, and hopefully the therapeutic and vaccines that will come will come along? Um, I think we need to figure out how to do that. And 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 funding public health <laughs> and good leadership, I think, are going to be really important in helping guide us in that in that quest forward. Uh, George. Uh, yeah, to follow up, I, I actually don't want to go back to normal. I think normal is pretty bad for giant proportions of the population and that we can do a lot better than we were doing there, uh, doing that. And in terms of equality, social justice, uh, even basic health care uh, for everyone, we have to make sure that there are some fundamental structural changes in our society, which will be much easier for people to accept uh, on the cusp of this pandemic. Uh, Kevin and uh, Kevin, I, I, I want you to expand just a little bit more before we go to questions about kind of the, uh, you know, we, we didn't really want to get into our politics in a large way, but this so much bleeds into our political world and, and these economic um, decisions being made right now are pretty important, like the $600 decision versus not $600. How, how do you look at this as an economist where we are? Um, well, I mean, I, we can go through specific policies like the six hundred dollar. Uh, I think that number where you're paying people more to stay home than many of those people would make from working is really probably not a good idea. I, I, I just think it creates we talked much about incentives. It doesn't create good incentives for people in terms of getting themselves back into the labor force, getting themselves back to work when it's safe to do so. Uh, you know, you really, you know, that people have good reasons to not want to be in. And, but you still want them if they decide based on their own to not have an artificial incentive to stay out of work. And I, I don't see why we want to have, we want to help people, but I don't think we want to be having incentives at that level that I think are going to slow down the recovery of the economy and have, again, as I said before, long term consequences for people in, in, in the US. Yeah, it's a, we have a perverse incentive on the one hand, and we have fear of death on the other hand. You know, we have, and then we have, and it, those are pretty powerful, powerful tools. And then we have children at home who can't, who, who don't can't receive care. It's it's a pretty chaotic situation. Um, before we go, let me go back to the panel before we go on. I want to ask another question before we go forward, um, and that is, so what do you think twenty twenty one is going to look like by summer of twenty twenty one? I just want a prediction before we go into questions. You know, I don't know the details of where we're going, but I'll tell you, we're going to continue to get better. We're going to continue to learn what we're doing, and hopefully people will still be listening as we learn more. We're, you know, look, think about the improvements we've made in terms of learning how to treat people. We're treating people much better than we were at the beginning, even in terms of who's getting infected. Now, it's not good for anybody to get infected, but the people on average who are getting infected are the people with lower consequences today. So we've made progress and I think we will continue to make progress as long as we don't try to push people so hard that fatigue becomes our enemy. And that's where you gotta say, when you make enough progress, do some good things, do some things better. So I, I think we'll continue to make progress. 2021 looks better. 2021 looks better. Next summer we'll have the same panel and a, a more- upward, Better, <laughs> better, better, not perfect. But, Better, better, better. George, what do you think, 2021? Uh, as long as we can not make any horrible, horrible mistakes, uh, 2021 should be better at least than, than this year. Audrey, what do you think? We can make it worse, though. We can make it worse. What do you think? I mean, I'm, I always say public health people are optimists, otherwise we wouldn't be in this field. So, <laughs> you know, um, we believe we can we can, we can, can make things better and things will get better. So, I, you know, we have to hope. It, it's it's too hopeless to not think that we are learning and getting better. And I, and I agree, like, we do see improvements already. Uh, I think, yeah, I think I'm going to take the privilege of giving my own opinion, um, which is, 
always my privilege. Um, the 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 uh, I think it's been just heartbreaking this last six months. Right? I think for all of us, from a public health point of view, family point of view, hospital point of view, it's been totally heartbreaking. And I do think that we've learned a lot about the rules of this infection. For example, in the beginning, we saw healthcare workers getting infected at a very high rate and dying. And now with masks and a proper uh, equipment, healthcare workers have a very low risk. It's very rare a healthcare worker gets infected. Many say they feel much safer at work than in the grocery store uh, for a variety of reasons. So that's a really positive thing. Second, the biology that leads us to these vaccines, they're very avant-garde, but the biology is very compelling. That is, we can protect animals very readily from infection with vaccines or with monoclonal antibodies that are similar to vaccines. And that's very compelling uh, as, as something to look forward to. It helps to justify the vaccines. And the third point is that um, we, if we have a treatment, if we have a test that's pretty simple to do in a doctor's office and a treatment that's readily available, whether it's an infusion or a shot, and we're pretty optimistic that we can make such a thing, that would stop the progression of disease, the whole world will change. And we're working so hard on those things that I would anticipate that they'll be available by 2021. So I personally am pretty optimistic about 2021. So now we're gonna to go to questions. And Audrey, I'm gonna ask you the first question, okay? Um, and all, although all kind of, it, there is a, this is a hard question, this is from the audience now. Um, the question has to do with the death rate and how much we should focus on how many people are getting infected versus how many people are dying. But I would kind of blend the question out a little bit more and say, it can't just be about death because there's morbidity and sometimes there's chronic morbidity. So if you just make it with the original argument we saw was, well, this is a bad coronavirus, but the death rate is no worse than influenza. Kind of we learned a terrible lesson from that whole dialogue that we all had in the beginning of this epidemic. So the argument is that if we have the true denominator, which is maybe 10 times the actual PCR positive nasal incidence, right? A lot of people are showing signs that they've had asymptomatic infection. To be more specific, maybe 40%, 50% of people have had asymptomatic infection. Symptomatic infection leads to recovery in most people. Some people go on to much more severe disease, including death. So the argument is that the death rate may be as low as 0.1%, and we're, we're too freaking out because people aren't going to die. Um, I, I don't know how you'd react to that mathematically and then from a societal point of view. I'll go to Audrey first and then George. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you summed it up well, Mike. I, I think the challenge is not just the death rate and there's all of these sequelae that we don't fully understand that we're seeing in people who've been infected, which could have lifelong consequences and, and, and costs and um, impact on quality of life. Um, and, and I think from the beginning, the argument has also been that, you know, even if it's 0.1, that if, the, if, if, if a large proportion of people get infected really quickly in a short period of time, it still can overwhelm the healthcare system. So that was part of the idea of, of flattening the curve was so that that didn't happen. So um, to just say it's, it's low, it's like the flu, it, we, the, you know, we can just go back to doing what we were doing before, I think is, is a false argument. Yeah. Well, let me ask you before we, leave, and for all of you, but before we leave that, another thing is as we fill the hospital with COVID patients, then we drive away people with heart disease, lung disease, all kinds of chronic health problems, who some, some of them have done pretty well showing maybe we overuse the health system. On the other hand, and also premature babies have disappeared. I'm sure you've read or heard about that, that, that something about pregnancy is different in the United States in the face of COVID, so there's no preemies for the neonatal ICUs. Did you know that, Audrey? No. There's far, there's far fewer preemies, and there's no real explanation. So so one of the externalities of, of as you point out, if it's 0.1% of five or 10 million people, is still a lot of people dying. It's not a small number of people dying. And then what percentage of people actually over 60 have severe infection and or chronic side effects? So. I think it's a complex question. It's good not to get COVID. The best thing is don't get COVID. That, that, that these COVID parties that we've heard about, like chicken box parties and such, they're, they're a bad idea. I think they're all good. Uh, George and, and, and uh, uh, Kevin, do you have any special thoughts about using death rate as a reassuring thing instead of the denominator of the number of new cases a day? Or I mean, this is a pretty big argument. Yeah, my only thought is that there's unlikely to be one number 
that's going to be able that you're going to be able to use to make major decisions about this. It's complicated. It's just we talk about quality of life and the long term effects and ability to breathe, but it is complicated, and that's why maybe epidemiologists get a bad rap, but they do get the rap that they kind of make things that you know they lose their self in their numbers and there's more more to life than the numbers. Yeah, I, I would say in pretty much in agreement that it's consequences that we should care about, not counts of cases, but death isn't the only important consequence. Uh, for example, in the case of the 1918 flu, you can see the consequences of that decades later in people who were young or in in vitro during that period of time who's who were subject to the infection, you can see it in their health outcomes 50 years later. And so, you know, it, the idea that the consequences are all about dying now, I think is wrong. I, I think you, you got it, but it is consequences we care about. Counting infections is not the one, but death is far from being the only potential consequence. So, so that metric alone is insufficient. We need a much richer metric to look at. And, and I think most of us think that this coronavirus infection is, is far more severe than our traditional uh, flu epidemics, at least from my point of view. Um, there's a, que a really smart question, Audrey. This is, I'm going to direct this at you. Um, and it is, okay, we did, and this is kind of like getting at Kevin's very first point tonight. It's like we did these lockdowns, these giant lockdowns, and now we know that masks work. How do we know that we shouldn't, that the masks aren't going to be just as good as any lockdown? Why bother with the lockdown? Why not really believe or come to believe that masks alone are actually sufficient based on what we know on masks? How do we know in this situation what actually what benefits us the most? Do you have a strong feeling about that, Audrey? No, and I don't think we're, you know, other than natural experiments and seeing what different places did and what happened, I think it's going to be hard to ever know that answer. I mean, I I regret that we didn't, when we did lockdown, that we didn't do it properly or that we stopped too soon because, you know, we, people suffered the consequences of staying home or many of us did and got fatigued and we didn't, we didn't get the benefit of it, right? Like they did perhaps in Europe. Um, so, you know, I think now we're kind of stuck with the alternative. I, I don't know how much people will tolerate some strict lockdown again. You know, we certainly have different phases and certain things are closed, but I think this point of fatigue and what people are willing to tolerate, and if they won't tolerate it, it won't work. If they don't comply, it's not going to work. And I kind of think that already happened the first time around. Yeah, in a lot Kevin, of time. Kevin's point. Don't you think that Hong Kong, which is far more populous than almost any place else that did nothing much more than make masks really aggressively mandatory, they had some cases. In Vietnam, the same situation. They never really locked down those countries, but everybody was comfortable with masks. All of Asia really did not do lockdowns at the level that we've done. I don't know, Kevin, do you have a strong feeling yeah, about this? I mean, it's not all about mandating masks. We had a population there who had prior experience and used masks. I mean, when you went to the airport and you saw somebody with a mask, chances are it was somebody from one of those countries that had seen the earlier infections where masks were utilized. I, I, in fact, I have friends in Hong Kong. I used to go to teach in Hong Kong every every year. And what did they do when we had the COVID outbreak? They sent me masks. And because they were using them in Hong Kong, and they said, Kevin, you're going to need masks. Here they are. <laughs> you know, they were, it was the population, not just the policy. Well, just following up on your argument, so how do you feel about seatbelts? Sometimes we do mandate things. What if we do mandate masks? So you wear, you have your seatbelt on, you know you'll get it. You don't use your cell phone to your ear in California. We do make mandated laws to protect. I, I think it's okay. I'm just saying the reason the Asian countries did so well wasn't necessarily all about mandates. It was. No, I understand the culture. culture was, but what if we did? But I want to argue with you for a second, just for fun. What if? What if we did mandate masks like we mandate seatbelts, and that you can't drive with your cell phone in some states? What if it's mandated and you get a ticket for not wearing your mask? Uh, are you diametrically opposed to that? If mass became a, a um, you know, a finable offense, like a traffic ticket? You know, I, I don't have, I'm not dead set against it. I think requiring people to wear masks, having reasonable enforcement for, you don't throw people in jail for not wearing a mask. I think, I think if you said you get a ticket if you're doing something or, or the proprietor of a store can ask you to leave, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. And if your employer can say, if you don't wear a mask, you can't go to work. And if you don't wear, you know, I think those kinds of things are fine. 
I, I don't I don't see a problem with that. And the good thing about masks, because like I said before, is the more you use them, the less you resist using them again. And the more other people are using it, the more you're going to use it. So, you know, when I was a kid, you know, in high school, drinking and driving was something that people just did all the time as high school students. Now young people are much more conscious of not drinking and driving, partly because we just beat it into people. That people have really learned that drinking and driving don't go together. And it takes time. You know, we don't have that kind of time here, but there's a learning process and you take advantage of that. Uh, George, what do you think about uh, some sort of fine making masks far more mandatory? This would be right up your alley in your opinion. Uh I'm not a big person uh, to make new crimes. Uh, I think that's almost always a mistake. Uh, I hope it's not going to be necessary. I think you first try to do everything you can do to encourage people to, to wear masks, make it easy, make, make the masks widely available, make it a cultural expectation. Um, I don't you have to decide how long you're going to let that, that experiment run before you say, all right, now it's a crime. You're going to pay, what, $100? Don't do it. I mean, we're we're starting a lot of fights already. People are fighting over masks so when they're not mandatory, and people aren't, aren't wearing them. And we're going to have some people shot because they're not wearing masks. I think that's terrible. Even though I think everybody should wear a mask, and I wear a mask when I go out. But you know. Audrey, strong opinions. Me? No, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it's, I, I, I agree, um, you know, with, with Kevin that I think that there's certain places where it, you can mandate it and it's easier to enforce. I think it's hard, you know, at a societal level. I don't know if the police want to go around giving people tickets for not wearing a mask, but if I own a business and somebody comes in and doesn't want to wear one, I think I have the right to ask them to leave. The same as a teacher, a professor in a classroom. If students aren't wearing masks in my classroom, I have the right to stop my lecture and walk out. So I think you know, that that's where I think there can be enforcement. Let me get to a couple of people asked very specific Kevin question, very specific George question. So I'm going to just read the very specific Kevin question. Dear Kevin, for Kevin, at what point does the level of deficit spending national debt become a legitimate consideration weighing slash evaluating the long term economic consequences of our reactions today? How does the answer inform the current debate over extending spending benefits? Kind of answered a little bit, but this is very specific. Yeah, you know, I think that's part of it, but a small part of it. I, I, there's a big economic issues here. How we're going to pay for it is part of it. It's not a question of whether we can afford it, though. It's really a question of whether it's a wise policy. And so, you know, now running a deficit, you're going to have to tax in the future, and taxes are costly. So you have to factor that in, but I would say the biggest costs are the more direct social costs. And I talked about them before, getting people to lose jobs, which has long-term consequences for their lives, distrust for government that has long-term consequences, students being out of school, very long-term consequences. And, you know, particularly for the most disadvantaged populations, when you keep people out of school, they're going to fall behind. And when they fall behind, they're going to be less successful. They're going to have worse health. Lots of bad things are going to happen if you impinge people's ability to get a quality education. And education is more important today than it's ever been. Objective evidence when it comes to health outcomes, economic outcomes, social outcomes, education is more important today than ever. And that's what really worries me, particularly elementary and secondary education. And it's not all about reading and math and science. It's about all the things you learn in school that help you in life. So actually, the, the current argument in the Congress about $100 billion or more towards schools to help schools reopen in the safest possible way and protect the households, you would probably be in favor of that expenditure based on what you said. Yeah, I think the Fed has bad track record in spending money in education. But, you know, the idea that we need edu resources and education has to be a focus for our country is that's a drum I've been beating for years before COVID. And COVID has just added to it. That's such an important part of where we need to go as a country is improving education, particularly K-12. How do you feel about college education since you work at a college? And I don't know Chicago's plans. I know UNC's plan. I actually don't know each of your plans. but I, I think we have a sensible plan. I actually do. I, I disagree with lots of things we do as a university, but I think on COVID we have, a, we have an opt-in plan on both sides. 
Teachers can opt into teaching in person or do it remotely and students have the opportunity to opt in if the professor opts in. Obviously, if the professor doesn't opt in, student doesn't have an option, but you know, where people opt in, I, it seemed like the best policy to me that it allowed people to do it when they thought it was safe. And, and you know, professors care about their students, students care about other students, mm -hmm. altruism plays a role. Decision-making, what I've been trying to make all along, you wanna allow people to do things when they think it makes sense. It's not going to be perfect decision making, but it's better than telling everybody, everybody you got to stay home or everybody you got to come in. I don't mm -hmm. like either of those. I see. Uh, interesting. Um, George, what, what's Boston uh, BU doing? Or BU? We're going to try to get everybody to come in. They don't have to come in if they don't want to, but we're expecting most people will want to have an in person education. And uh, unless our professors uh, have a uh, bona fide disability, they're expected to be teaching in class. Uh, George, there's a question specifically for you. George, regarding maybe it's somebody who knows you personally because he called you George. <laughs> could be. <laughs> it could be somebody in our audience. Dear George, regarding states mostly in the Northeast right now, like Massachusetts, requirements for quarantining testing after travel from other states, mostly in the South, like Florida and the Midwest, um, is this unprecedented, unprecedented in U.S. history? Have we this whole idea of viruses and borders and police, state police stopping you that you do some quarantine when you go from Florida to New York, which I don't know how it's enforceable? Um, is there a history? Of, have we ever done this in this country? No, you know? we've never done this. There's no. Uh, I mean. Massachusetts can't say anything about people who don't live in Massachusetts. So all this is what happens to you when you get back to Massachusetts. If you can, this work? can this work? No. <laughs> I mean, theoretically, it could be. Our governor has said, uh, unless I misunderstood him, that this is all basically voluntary. You're going to have a record of everybody who went, left the state and came back, and you're going to be highly encouraged to go into a 14-day quarantine or be tested before you come back. And have a negative test. Uh, well, the, 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 I don't the, see how it discourages people from leaving the state, though. Yeah, the, another problem we have is understanding the test. We understand a positive. We have a lot of trouble understanding a negative. I understand. That. We, 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 the, and then that brings me to another question about universities. Oh, do you want to say a, a bit, just a couple of words about the policy at the University of North Carolina? Well, it's more like a hybrid of what our colleagues are talking about opting in, opting out for students, opting in, opting out. You want to say a word about the, the study you're doing? Um, well, I, I mean, I think all I think what all universities are struggling with right now is testing of asymptomatic um, students and faculty and what that looks like. And yeah, I mean, we're doing a study among research faculty, research and support staff to look at asymptomatic infection. But I think this is a big challenge just to the point you made, Mike, of what, what do these tests mean? We've seen on our campus outbreaks um, in certain groups with lots of testing of asymptomatic still. And so I think it's challenging when the test you take today only means as much as it does today, you know, or do you have virus yet? So I think some of the, the tools we have are not what we want them to be, or they're not how we want to interpret them to be in terms of a, a, an answer. We test all our students coming in, you know, tomorrow on day one, great, we know who's positive and who's negative, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be infection right. starting the next day. Yeah, Americans like technical solutions. So one of the technical solutions is to convince yourself it's all going to be okay at your university because you've tested everyone before they come back at some time frame or when they get to campus as if, and this is the military strategy for, for, uh, for na a naval strategy. Recruits are tested, they're isolated, then they're put on the boat with the beliefs that, well, but we can't isolate college, to my knowledge, it's not like a nunnery. So the college students are going to mingle. And even if we have great negative students at zero time, it's hard for us to know whether this experiment's gonna work. Another technological solution we've seen recommended in a modeling exercise is why don't we test, this is an expensive solution. We're a rich university. We're gonna test every student twice a week for the entire semester. And then we're gonna take the students who demonstrate infection and put them in the isolation dorm. The question is, does the university have the infrastructure to isolate a big university in 20, 30, 40,000 students? 
who can isolate that many students that might become positive should you have super spreaders and such. So, but these, by the way, are experiments that are gonna go on this fall. We are going to learn really quickly what works and doesn't work. All of our universities are gonna stay open or close uh, pretty quickly, depending on what we learn from what every university intends to do. And it's gonna be pretty interesting in September. Uh, it's been an exciting, <laughs> exciting time in higher education with the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, let me ask a question um, that is for all three of you, but really directed at Kevin. Um, at what point do the negative impacts of the lockdown strategy vastly outweigh the virus itself, effects on our economy, our mental health, and our physical health? How do we know when, when almost throwing up our hands and saying it's better to let the society get infected? This obviously ignores our attempts to find a biological solution. So Kevin, is there, is there a metric where it's some, and this is, is there a metric? Yeah, I mean, if you ask the question of what have the costs been so far, uh, actually, my colleague, Casey Mulligan, who was a co-author with me on, on the paper, I think, that many people saw before this conference, he, he has a, been estimating, you know, on a, basically a daily basis what the accumulated health costs and, you know, non-health other costs are. Um, and, you know, basically the non-health costs have greatly outweighed the health costs incurred so far. That doesn't mean we've done something wrong because pandemics are a big deal and people are willing to do a lot to avoid getting it. And, you know, but it's, his numbers are like 85, 15, that like 85% of the costs we've borne are not in on the health dimension. It's really been avoiding the disease. <clears throat> and here's where I think a vaccine or what you call a biological solution really plays in because the vaccine is probably biggest benefits gonna be to reduce both of those costs, not just the health costs. That is, you know, we're gonna get great value if we can get something that reduces the disease burden because we'll have both less disease and less economic impact. Well, let me ask, have the risk of asking an economist a really stupid question. Um, so this might be a stupid question, but I, I guess as you're calculating it in empiric, with empiric data, the issue is if we kept people from Death has a cost, you know, like your day, life years lost of productive life. That's in there. That's in his numbers. That's how we do it. However, however, if it's if we let if just throw up our hands and let more people die, even at 0.1 or 0.2 percent or whatever, it will shift the balance automatically, right? It will. It will. If we what we've done today has prevented death at the cost. So we've shifted the cost. Exactly. So, That's my point. Is it, okay. It's so not we, like we a cost solution. Okay, we, we purposely shifted the cost. We could decide life is less worth worth less to us because of the, I mean, it does sound terrible, the long-term consequences on the economy and our society and let, and have more people die, it would shift the cost very quickly um, away from society and towards the death cost. Is, is that correct, Kevin? Or? Yeah, I mean, you could. I'm not saying that's wise. I, everything we know about people's decisions regarding health and other aspects of their life says health is incredibly important. I've done a lot of work on the long-term benefits to society of improvements in economic conditions and improvements in health. And basically over the long-term, people have gained as much from healthier, longer lives or more than they've gained from being richer. If you gave them sort of a hypothetical, you can go back a hundred years and you can either take the prosperity gains that we've gotten with you or you can take the longevity gains that you've gotten with you. Our estimates are basically the longevity gains are worth somewhat more than the improvement in the standard of living from the point of view of people. So it's not surprising to me that we've taken a lot of costs on other dimensions. It's not saying it's a bad idea. Now that doesn't mean we've done everything smart. It is you want to say there's a trade-off. People value health a lot, but are there places where we've incurred more costs than we've gained in benefits? I think the answer is probably yes there too. Well, let me let me shift because we're running out of time, and let me shift then to kind of almost the final question. I'll start with Audrey, and and it's appropriate because Vice President Pence is visiting tomorrow. Audrey, I just learned you've been invited to meet with him. That's, that's not true, but could be true. Um, <laughs> it might be true. That's talking about transparent, made-up things. Uh, so, what were the three things? Now you control the federal response. You are now going to be uh, the head of the task force. And it, your decision of the three things you're going to do right now um, to change the federal response to COVID that's going to benefit us, and, and ignoring the investment in vaccines and treatments that have already been made. 
It's still with yeah. our belt. Yeah, we gotta fix the supply chain. I mean, I think it's ridiculous this far into the epidemic that we still are, are running out of um, reagents for the tests and it's taking this long to, to get results back. So that, that so needs to be number fixed. One, number one, you're gonna, you're gonna nationalize the supply chain, federalize it, and, and that's mm -hmm. number one. Something so, needs to be fixed with the supply, yeah. Um, and then I think the point about, you know, um, having, well, clear messaging, I think is really important about what people should do about mask wearing, about physical distancing. Um, I think money for public health, for the CDC, for for, low, for for states, for their public health response is really important. And I'm going to add schools in there too, giving schools money. You got, to you got a fourth. Well, no, I think very wise. No, you said those are wise uh, things. George, what are, what are your three? You can't just steal orders. I just do one. I just, just, that's everybody wear masks and then we'll work from there. Mask, yeah, I was on a new show. Mask, 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 mask. And then if you're thinking about it, why don't you get another mask? Some other stuff too, but let's get the mask straight. Yep. Yeah. Well, Audrey's point is a really good point, though. We, I mean, I, this is unfixable. By no, no, no. It's a point about uh, transparency and a, a single voice. It's funny because governments usually are communicators. They say the same thing over and over and over, the same thing over and over and over again as we went through with HIV and treatment, you know, get treated, get treated, get treated. There was no ambivalence. It was like everyone gets us, everyone get treated. How we ended up with this ambivalence about mass, it makes no sense by, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. So, uh, okay, but your, well, your point is taken. We, we, and Kevin, you get the last word. I, I would do, you know, I hate to jump on the same bandwagon, but I, consistency and clarity of message, I think, clearly plays a role. In terms of priorities, schools, again, I think I've said this many times, is so important for our long-term long -term health. And, and I just think that those two would be things that I would focus very much on, the consistency of message. And a lot of that message is going to be about things like masks. And finally, be careful about nationalizing the supply chain. I, that's always, the government doesn't have a great track record at doing those. Things. Uh, it really doesn't. And I would be careful about doing that. Again, I think working with people, that is incentivizing them, giving them access to and, and helping them pay for. If people are demanding more of these things and they want more of these things, you can incentivize them to want it. And if you do that, more people will do it. Well, you, you must be right because we incentivize vaccine development and have spent billions of dollars on vaccine development, and we have seven vaccines in a pipeline for the next two months. I guess your argument would be we didn't properly incentivize testing and contact tracing early enough, and we, we handled it in a way that wasn't I – mean, I, can, I can accept that. If we had spent the money on that, divided the vaccine money and the testing money, maybe that would have been a better uh, – it's not that there's no money in testing. It's not about dividing the money. The money is a drop in the bucket in these calculations. The cost to society of both the disease and the economic hardship is like an order of magnitude higher than the direct expenditures on things like vaccine and supply chain and things like that. They're, uh, they're, they're in like different units. It's like one's in, one's in millions and one's in billions and one's in trillions. And they sound a lot alike, but billions and trillions are a lot different. <laughs> So you, you've made that point that we've we got our, our economy of scale wrong. You, you've made that point before, you, that our economy of scale is off. We you failed to take into consideration what failure to act was going to do. We got it right in the vaccine space because we made seven vaccines in six months. We got it kind of wrong in the public health space. I, would you accept that argument? Yeah. As I say, if we had nationalized vaccine development, think of where we'd be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, no, that's, you know, that's a great way. That's a, you know what, Kevin? That's a good way to, to let me end it on behalf of the University of North Carolina. Let me let me thank the organizer of, the, of this, um, who have not really been proud of Mark McNeely and Sarah Truel, Truitt and um, um, Eric Youngst and many other faculty worked on putting this together. We really appreciate the time. Terry Rhodes, Terry Rhodes, yeah, from the from the school. The university really appreciates the audience participating in this. We really appreciate the panelists spending a couple of hours with us in anticipation of this uh, uh, before this and for this event. I want to thank everyone for listening. I hope it was um, educational. But thank you so much on behalf of the university and myself and our panelists. And I guess this will be goodbye forever. <laughs> 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 Let's all wave goodbye.
we didn't have, really have a way to end this, but I think it's seven o'clock, so we'll end. No, Thank, great. You. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.